Good morning. morning. Welcome you to worship on this third Sunday in the season of Advent. This is the Sunday when we celebrate the joy of the season as we anticipate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And speaking of that, it is drawing closer, of course, to Christmas Eve. And uh, I think you've all seen the announcements that there will be two Christmas Eve services uh, this year. And the first one will be very much tailored to be welcoming to children. Uh, I hope to, it will be a fun time. I leave some uh, laughs, maybe. It will be a, a little bit of an impromptu pageant, and the story will be told in rhyme, interspersed with some of our favorite carols. So I encourage you, if you, encourage you, if you know families, to especially invite them. And then at 7.30 is our traditional service, uh, candlelight service. And uh, also, please invite your friends to attend that. A reminder that immediately following the service this morning, there will be a congregational meeting to elect church officers. I'll remind you again at the close of the meeting about that. And are there another, there are another, there was another announcement. I'm Jim Gresham, and I'm here to ask you to mark your calendars for one week from today at three o'clock in the afternoon in this very place the Bellingham Community Chorus, which has among its members five from this choir. Uh, They will be singing a wonderful Christmas concert of about 14 pieces. I think you'll enjoy it. It's free. There's food after. Um, So that's 3 o'clock, one week from today. Uh, remind the women of the church as well that the women's luncheon is this Tuesday. It's been it's early this month due to Christmas, and they will be having uh, sharing lunch together and enjoying a special guest, a storyteller. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. that again. So sing, daughter Zion, raise the rafters, Israel. Daughter Jerusalem, be happy, celebrate. God has reversed the judgments against you and sent your enemies off chasing their tails. From now on, God is Israel's king in charge at the center. There's nothing to fear from evil ever again. Jerusalem will be told, don't be afraid, dear Zion. Don't despair. On Judgment Day, I'll bring you back home, a great family gathering. You'll be famous and honored all over the world. You'll see it with your own eyes, all those painful partings turned into reunions. God's promise. It's getting closer. We can feel it. The days are shorter, but the lights burn more brightly. God's new day is coming. Let us look with eagerness toward the horizon. Let us seek glimpses of God's salvation. Today we light the candle of joy. We rejoice at the dawn of God's redeeming grace.
don't be afraid. God does not turn away from us, but draws near. God does not hold what we have done against us, but takes away the judgments we fear. Trusting in God's love and mercy, let us confess our sins before God and one another. God of grace, through the voice of the prophets, you call us to repent so that our faithfulness might be renewed. Help us to heed their words, even when they judge us, for they offer hope and healing. Forgive us when we turn our eyes from the poor, overwhelmed by the world's need. Help us understand that you do not ask us to do everything, but simply to respond with compassion to those around us. Teach us to use our gifts for the common good and to know that in giving, we will receive joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Do not fear, for God is in our midst. In Christ, God has taken away the judgments against us. By grace, we are forgiven. Rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. Amen. Now, during the Song of Blessing, I invite the children to come forward. The young and the young at heart are welcome to join me in the front. morning, children. I'm this way. Good morning. There you are. Can you say good morning? Good morning. Did you notice that I brought something with me here? Are you starting to see packages show up around? Yeah, you are? Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever look at them and maybe start to wonder what's inside? Do you shake them sometimes? You sniff them? You do? Try to guess. What do you think might be in here? Do you have any guesses? What might be in this bag? No? Think it's a toy? Or maybe food? I'm going to show you, and I think you will be surprised what's in here. Okay, I'm going to show you one thing. Let's see. Are you excited? You're going to be really excited when you see this. Oh, boy, you're going to be excited. Is that exciting? Yeah? It's a can of tuna fish. Wow. Would you like to get that for Christmas? You would? Haley's not so sure. Not so sure. 
Well, there's a... Yes, Santa Claus. You think he'll bring you the tuna fish? Okay, I brought you this because of the Bible. Santa Claus brings toys. Santa Claus brings toys, not tuna fish. Okay. That in our Bible story today, there's a man named John the Baptist, and he's one that helps us get ready for Christmas because he helps us get ready for Jesus coming in the world. And you know what he said? He told people that if you have two coats... You should give one of them to anyone who doesn't have a coat and do the same with food. Well, you know what I have in here? Can you guess what I have in here? I have two cans of tuna fish. So what should I do with one of them, do you think? I bet somebody out there knows. What should I do with one of my cans of tuna fish? Share it with somebody who's hungry. And you know, we just happen to have a place for things like this, don't we? Out in the narthex. There's a special basket. I will give you that can. And when you leave for class, you can put that in the basket. And you know what, Haley? I think I have more tuna fish at home. So what should I do with this can? Maybe you can put it in there. Okay, what else do I have in here? Um, let's see. I'll show you this first. This isn't just one present. This is a whole bunch of presents. Have you seen this? Out in the narthex? This is the giving catalog of the Presbyterian Church, and I bet you gave this to somebody last year. Did you give one of those to someone last year? What is that? What's that? What's that a picture of? What is it? Mm. You know what that is? What's that a picture of? Um, a camel. Camel? Close. Yeah. What do you think it is? You think that it's a goat. So in this... We can pick all kinds of things we can give. Look at the piggy. Isn't he cute? Yeah, Yeah, big ears. All kinds of wonderful wonderful things. So, see what else? What else is here? And this tells us about another way we can give. Why don't I hold that for you for a minute, okay? Until you go. And this today we're going to hear about the Christmas joy offering. And with this we can share with people... Uh, who are church workers who don't have enough money because they're retired or they have uh, medical issues, and we can give to special schools for our racial ethnic people and help them learn so they can get good jobs and have a better life. Those are pretty exciting presents, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Pretty cool. The thing about Christmas is it reminds us of how God wants us to live the whole year. And when we give to people, then we are happy, right? Let's have a prayer before you go, okay? We thank you, God, for this season in which our hearts are opened and we and our hands outstretched to share with others what we have. And we pray that, indeed, the spirit of the season would stretch all year long. Amen. So as you go to your class, take that and put it in the basket, okay? Thank you. You can go now. (laughs) Let us not neglect to do good, but instead let us share what we have. God rejoices when our faith bears fruit, and that fruit brings hope and healing to the world. Will the ushers please come forward?
With praise and thanksgiving, we offer these gifts, gracious God, praying that they will enable others to draw all they need from the deep wells of your generosity, of your healing, of your grace. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we hear your word, O Lord, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth and shape our wills that we may desire your ways through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 which can be found on page 198 in your pew Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord.
Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke in the third chapter, beginning at verse 7. This may be found on page 60 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible, if you would like to read along. Last week we heard about John the Baptist who comes, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Today we hear more of what that voice had to say. Listen now to God's word for us. John said to the crowd that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And with... Whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, today we we lit the pink candle in our Advent wreath, interrupting the blue mood of this season. I'm sure many of you remember when the candles were a different color, the three. They were purple, right? A color that points to the royalty of Christ and also to the penitence called for in the season as we reflect on on our faithfulness in light of the approaching kingdom of God. In recent years, though, many churches have begun to use blue instead to represent the longing of this season. Deep blue, the color of the pre-dawn sky, reminds us that God's reign is about to dawn in Jesus, and we look forward with longing to his arrival. Advent, then, is marked both by deep yearning and by profound joy as we anticipate Christ's coming into our world. And joy is represented by the pink of the candle this week. It's as if on this third Sunday the church says, enough of penitence and longing. Let's be joyful at least for today. Today is for rejoicing as we draw closer to hearing again the tidings, the glad tidings of Christ's birth. We light the pink one and rejoice in the good news of the imminent advent of God's grace. Well, that theme of joy was sounded in the reading that was shared during our candle lighting from Zephaniah and also certainly in our reading from Philippians. But when we come to the gospel text today, we encounter a decidedly different mood. In Luke, we hear John's bombastic voice ringing out in the wilderness, calling those coming for baptism a bunch of snakes. That hardly inspires joy, does it? 
Next to the other readings today, the gospel text grates like a discordant note in an orchestra or like a voice in the choir purposely singing off pitch. Each time, each year around this time, Joyce, or John's voice falls on our ears like a harsh and judgmental rant interrupting our holiday cheer. Try to imagine, if you can, John showing up at one of your holiday parties, for instance. <laughs> Uninvited, of course. Can you imagine the startled expressions on the faces of your guests when they hear his voice just as they're about to enjoy your special holiday dip? And they're sharing their casual conversations about their recent travel or their children's latest accomplishments. John's voice hardly would be welcome, nor would his message likely be appreciated. That discordant note clashes with our holiday merriment. How, we wonder, do John's words fit the intended mood of joy on this Sunday? And perhaps more to the point, how is it that our gospel lesson concludes with these words? So with many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. Did it sound like good news to you? Right after the idea of unquenchable fire? Is that how you would characterize John's message? How do we reconcile the phrase good news with his calling people a brood of vipers? It almost strikes me as if Luke had a pile of stock endings and he accidentally grabbed the wrong one to tack on what he writes about John's preaching. Well, to understand how John's message can be good news, I think it helps to know who was among those who came to him for baptism. They included tax collectors and soldiers. The tax collectors, many of you know, were among the most despised people in that time and place because they took advantage of the people for personal gain. The Romans left them free to collect whatever extra they wanted beyond the prescribed amount and keep it for themselves. But John says, stop collecting more than the prescribed amount. And he tells the soldiers in that crowd to stop exhorting money by threats or false accusations and to be satisfied with their pay. So these are people who took advantage of their fellow Jews for personal gain and profited, moreover, by their association with the unwelcome and hated occupiers of their land. Hardly anyone would have been more loathed than they. And hardly anybody would have expected redemption less. John's words are harsh, to be sure, but they hold the promise of mercy, of forgiveness, of grace. Of course, of course John's message is good news to them. We get that, right? But what about us? Surely these words are not intended for our ears. After all, we're church-going folks, basically good people. Maybe we think these words would be mostly directed at common criminals and white-collar thieves, certainly at terrorists on all who kill or abuse, exploit or mistreat or otherwise prey on other people. We might think, in other words, that his message is aimed at those who are clearly, undeniably, indisputably bad. And we might get away with that if we didn't read the passage with more care. And when we do, though, we notice that when John calls people a brood of vipers, he's not speaking only or even first to ruffians and scoundrels, but to those who might claim Abraham as their ancestor, pointing to their religious credentials as evidence of their righteousness, as if that settled things, as if that were enough. 
Not so fast, John says. Hey, God can take a rock and turn it into a child of Abraham. It's not religious status that's going to save you. It's not church membership or worship attendance. You must bear fruits, John says, worthy of repentance. Well, to the people's credit here, they ask, okay, what are we supposed to do? Tell us. It's simple, says John. Share what you have. If you have two coats, give one to somebody without one. If you have more than enough food, share with someone who is hungry. And that's great. That is good. We should do those things. In fact, we do do those things. But I suspect that John is talking about something more here. After all, the Jews practiced almsgiving. Because John's preaching hearkened back to the biblical prophets and anticipated Jesus' kingdom message, it is hard for me to imagine that he wasn't calling for something more than cleaning out our closets and giving to food banks, as good and right as those things are. Like the prophets before him and Jesus who followed, though, John knew that this world is broken. That God's intentions for humankind have been thwarted by selfishness and greed. In other words, by sin. And sin, as theologians are fond of reminding us, is not merely individual, but it is corporate. It is expressed in the economic inequalities and social injustices in the structures of this world. It's no less true now than it was in John's time. I'm sure you've heard some of the statistics about economic inequality. A recent Forbes magazine article reported that America's 20th, 20 wealthiest people, a group that could fit comfortably in one single Gulfstream G650 luxury jet, whatever that is, <laughs> I haven't been on one. <laughs> they now own more wealth than the bottom half of the American population combined, a total of 152 million people. The wealthiest 100 households now own about as much wealth as the entire African-American population of the United States. And the Forbes 400, with a combined worth of $2.34 trillion, Dollars own more wealth than the bottom 61% of the country combined, a staggering 194 million people. Do those statistics stun you? If they do, then consider this. They add that this is probably an underestimation of the concentration of wealth, since it is possible to hide assets in offshore tax havens and legal trusts. The growing outrage over the widening gap between the rich and poor in our country, I think, can easily overshadow the disparity among the nations. Which country is richest varies according to the list consulted and the measurements that are used, but clearly we are near the top of the list. No matter how disadvantaged we might feel compared to those on that metaphorical jet, most of us are way better off than most of the people in this world. And we know, of course, we know that our standard of living is a, re a result of our disproportionate use and consumption of the world's resources. And unless we change the way we live, the way we consume, the rest of God's people will never share equally in the abundance of God's gifts. I am a real downer, aren't I? You might not want me around any more than John at this point. But here's the thing, people. Here's the thing. The gospel is bad news before it is good news, as one of my favorite authors, Frederick Buechner, has said. The gospel points out our faults and our foibles, what the old preachers call sin, in order to call us to newness, to call us to true righteousness. 
Now, our sins are not nearly as outrageous as those of many people. Certainly not as much as the tax collectors and soldiers or those we so easily label bad. Ours tend to be more subtle, so much so that we may not even recognize them. One of the mistakes that we make in this season, wrote biblical scholar Elizabeth Actmeyer, is thinking that we are immune from Advent's judgment. That the faith or the goodness or importance or status we brought into the service this morning with us is sufficient to guarantee the approval of our lives in God's eyes. But as she notes, God does not tend probably to see us as we see ourselves. And even we recognize that Christ coming into our world casts a different light on our living and realize that there is something wrong, something terribly wrong in our world and in our personal lives. Our pride keeps getting in the way of our concern for other people, for one thing, she says. Our love for our comfort and the status quo undermines our zeal for justice, for another thing. Our wish not to be interrupted in our accustomed pursuits defeats our care for the outside world. And the Advent season is when we repent and we confess that those things are so. Consciously or not, we are shaped by the values of this world. And those values teach us to put self first, to use whatever power we have to our own advantage and to rationalize our choices because pretty much everyone else does the same thing. And since our faults are shared by most of the people we know, they don't exclude us from anybody's company or ostracize us even here. And so we can bring them with us comfortably into church and carry them out again just as easily with nothing changed. We are not changed. And then, then we miss our chance for grace. We fail to hear the good news addressed to us because that news is bad before it is good, and we haven't heard any bad news aimed our way. We haven't absorbed the message that we are not as we should be, but that doesn't mean that we cannot change. We can repent, which, as I've said before, doesn't just mean feeling sorry, but means turning around, acting differently, living differently, so that our lives bear fruit of repentance. Now, I'm not going to presume to tell you what that fruit might be for you, although John provides some pretty good hints. Instead, I invite you, as I invite myself, I'm part of this too, to look again at the gospel in this season and to reflect on what change might be called for in our lives in order that we might become more just, more generous, more faithful. And then we will ourselves become good news for this world. Amen. Please stand as we join together in this morning's affirmation of faith. We believe in God, the creator and lover of the earth, origin and destiny of us all. We believe in Jesus Christ, God coming to us in the fragile promise of a baby yet unborn who emerges as the herald of hope, God's laughter in the face of despair. Plunged into death and hell, he broke free the captives and is leading the way to the land of promise where justice and peace will flourish. We believe in the Holy Spirit who implants the seed of truth, brings us to birth as the body of Christ and empowers us to confront and transform all that is corrupt degrading and deceitful. We believe in the coming reign of God, 
announced by the Baptist, it has drawn near to us in Jesus and will be consummated in the glorious marriage of earth and heaven, when all who have passed through the world's deep sorrow will be raised from the waters, robed in righteousness, and gathered into the joyous fulfillment of God's desire. For the coming of that day, on this day, we work and pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Our hymn this morning, sermon hymn, is number 96, In Glory to God, on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist's Cry. Be seated. Let us come before God now with our prayers of petition. Let us pray. Holy, loving, and righteous God, we give you thanks for the joy and the wonder of this season. And we ask that you would help us see beyond the glitter and the glitz to discern once again the meaning of Christ coming into our world and to have our eyes and hearts open for glimpses of the dawn of your redeeming grace. We do indeed pray that we would be open to your transforming power, that our lives would become more just and compassionate, Help us be willing to open our eyes to the hurt and the needs of this world and to be moved toward compassion for others and to be willing to work for justice and peace that all people might realize the dawn of your kingdom. We pray for this world, O oh God, in this time when there seems to be so much darkness how much, God, we need your light to dawn. We pray for the victims of violence of so many kinds. We pray for the wisdom of our leaders to find solutions to that violence. We pray for people streaming out of war-torn countries that they would find a place of welcome and refuge. We pray for those who open their doors to receive them, that you would empower them and uplift them in that mission of mercy. We pray, O oh God, for understanding within our own country that fear might not turn us toward distrust, that we would remember that this country is founded on freedoms and that we ourselves came here from other lands, most of us. 
pray as well, O oh God, for those we know personally who are struggling in this season. It is hard in this time to be dealing with loss and grief when others might expect us to feel joy. It is hard in this time to lack resources when others are sharing gifts. It is hard in this time to be without a home when others are gathering for times of fellowship and celebration. We pray for those who are hurting and hungry, for those who are lonely or homeless. Work through us, O oh God, and open our hearts and open our hands to reach out in love. Be with us as we continue our Advent walk. Soften our hearts and broaden our minds and enter us, O oh God, anew, that we may indeed become good news to your world. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and now together say the prayer he taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, number 100, My Soul Cries Out with a Joyful Shout.
even though our benediction begins with the word, word go, you will not be going if you are a member of the church immediately. I remind you that there will be a congregational meeting. Um, so if you happen to be a visitor who wandered in here this morning, you're welcome to stay and observe the workings of the church. It'll only take about probably five minutes or less, or you may uh, choose to go and enjoy coffee, but I hope you'll stay so we may have the opportunity to greet you. Go now rejoicing in God. Have no fear, but in all things trust the Lord. Bear fruits worthy of repentance, sharing what you have, and showing compassion to all. And may God rejoice over you with gladness. May Christ renew you in love, and may the Spirit guide you as you walk in the ways of faithfulness. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share signs of God's peace.